This is Christy Drutman, and you are listening to Brown Girl Green, where I interview environmental leaders and advocates about the importance of justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion, as well as creative solutions to the climate crisis. I'm working to change the image of what it means to be an environmentalist in the 21st century. I'm currently recording this podcast on Muncie Lenape land. This is your daily reminder that we are all living on stolen land. Today, we are covering a very important topic, which is the prison industrial complex, specifically about the toxicity and the human rights abuses happening within prisons uh, when it relates to environmental justice. Today, we have a speaker from Fight Toxic Prisons who is going to educate us all about this issue. And so I'd love if you could take a moment to introduce yourself. Hello, I'm um, Big Villainous, also known as BP. Um, I'm an organizer of Fight Toxic Prisons, as well as a YouTuber and artist. Um, I use my platform to help elevate uh, Fight Toxic Prisons, as well as I'm on a tour right now where I go to all 50 states and do workshops on Fight Toxic Prisons and what we do and what our work's about. So could you just, you know, set the context for us? What is the relationship between environmental justice and incarceration? Well, I mean, there's multiple layers to it, right? Because one, like people are part of the environment. And so when we talk about it, like we also talk about like how people are toxified through the prison industrial complex, Um, not only through like, you know, being exposed to pollutants with inside prisons, because a lot of prisons, specifically federal prisons, um, they build prisons a lot of times on super fun sites, which is like places that they dispose of toxic waste, um, weapons from the military, so on and so forth, that pollutes the soil and makes it really untenable. And so it becomes a national sacrificial site, for example. Um, And they build prisons on top of that. So then that seeps into the people as well as it's just um, destructive to the environment, as well as the fact that a lot of prison labor is utilized to uh, then bolster the military industrial complex, which is like the greatest polluter across the world. and there's also the fact of prisoners being at the forefront. Um, not only do they destroy environments to build the prisons, but prisoners specifically being at the forefront of uh, being affected by climate change, but also being the ones that have to fight it. Whether they're talking about um, fighting fires and being used, paying a dollar a day to fight the fires that are happening because of climate change, or many other uh, situations to that akin. And... You know, I love that you're getting into some definitions here to to build off of that. Could you explain to people who might not know, what is the prison industrial complex? So the prison industrial complex is is how we describe the industry of the prisons, right? So it's how the U.S. has built multiple prisons and how that makes a profit for specific people. For example, um, they're able to utilize slave labor because people don't realize the 13th Amendment did not end slavery, but instead industrialized it into the prison industrial complex, right? Um, and there's a whole prison industry built, built off of, you know, McDonald's, Walmart, all of them benefit from prison labor. You know, they goes to use that labor to uh, bolster um bolster the uh, uh, corporations and situations like that that are invested in it, as well as uh, individual companies that are specifically um, target um, prisoners, you know, uh, through commissary, Um, as well, of course, the military, the military thing, being able to get cheap labor to um, then build, for example, missiles, their um, build their trailers, which is a prison that I was at, we would build the trailers going the back of the truck if you were in Unicor. Um, So there's a there's a whole industry that's made off of the incarceration and enslavement of marginalized people, specifically black and brown folks, but also even poor white folks get hit by it, you know, so. Thank you for laying that all out, because, you know, some people just, you know, they hear that term and they're like, you know, it sounds really intense, but like they don't exactly know what that means. So thank you for educating us on what that is. That was a good breakdown. To build off of that, could you explain more about what you were saying at the beginning of this about the conditions uh, people are facing inside of prisons and how that makes them more vulnerable to environmental and health impacts? And if you have any examples you could specifically offer about that, that'd be really helpful too. Well, I mean, there's multiple ways the conditions inside of prison. For one, like just the prison itself being physically toxic, right? Being um, and when I mean physically toxic, I mean like not just that physically toxic because of what it does to people um, and the dehumanization and how that toxifies 
people's mentality and destroys communities and makes it toxic in that way. But physically toxic also is in the soil, the dust, the water, the things that are you are living in and around being toxified. Um, but also when it comes to like the things that they feed us, for example, a lot of uh, situations literally have containers that say not for human consumption, but they're feeding those foods that are so low quality that they wouldn't generally feed it to people, to prisoners, right? Um, it could be the way that the labor, um, when they are exposed to situations with labor, we don't get the same protection that people will get on the outside. I mean, I just talk from experience, honestly. Is generally how I would do as far as I'm talking about the conditions of prisons. You know, because each prison is different, but they all have similar type of situations, at least the way the staff, the way the prison itself handles itself. Um, so, like, one of the things that you will find when you're in prison specifically is how atrocious the medical care is, right? As far as, like, you know, um, not only would they put you on toxified environments, but they don't really care to... Uh, treat you for any things that come from it. Like I remember this one person when I was in prison that literally had a tumor like you could visibly see growing out of his head and they would not treat him until he they just basically let him die. When they left left the compound and that was it, he had passed away. But they wouldn't take him to a hospital. He was like begging for treatment. People did not care. Um, the thing is like when it comes to the food, like I said, the, the conditions of like I was saying, um, a lot of that come from not for human consumption. Um, also, like they don't really cook; they, they generally they don't cook it in the same way as you would. Right? They just throw it into a vat, like like a, a tray, and everything goes through it that way. Because it's we're being fed like we're like a farm animals. You know what I mean? Like we're there as literally like an animal. Like you would imagine slaves would have been back in the day, except it's just a different type of format. Instead of getting whipped, we get thrown in cells and locked in cells for a long period of time. Um, uh, I mean, there's, I don't know, there's multiple different ways it plays an impact, but it definitely differs depending on the prisons. Because there are some prisons, um, for example, like during the hurricane, where if you're in a certain prison, right, they don't want to evacuate, like what they did with Beaumont. When Beaumont um, got hit, I forget which hurricane it was, got hit with the hurricane, they pretty much just locked everybody down um, inside the prison and then it let it flood and evacuated the staff. Um, during that time, uh, they were only given eight ounces of water a day to drink in the middle of the summer. And like, don't get twisted. Just because there's a hurricane doesn't mean it's not sweltering hot. You know what I mean? And that water that's all around you is not safe to drink. Um, so as it's filling up, they ended up going up to like chest height for some people. Um, they ended up having to have the only option of clean water to drink being out of the toilet, which led to like, I think it was two or three people dying from bacterial infections from having to drink the toilet water. Um, and so that's actually how FTP specifically started doing like hurricane responses because after we found out what they were like, nah, this is not cool. They need to evacuate. But, you know, they don't really care to do that in most uh, in most places. Um, or they didn't until we started putting pressure on, pressure on them. Then uh, slowly it's been changing, luckily. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Like, can you can you give us more of like the backstory of, you know, fight toxic prisons? Like, how did you get into this work? Like, you know, how did the organization form? Like, I'm just curious. It sounds like there, there's been a lot of like, seeing some messed up stuff and then, you know, wanting to do something about it. But I want to know more from you how that came about. Um, so I can give a broad, um, a broad general thing about how it formed. I don't know that history as good because I came after it already started because I, I came after, I think, the second convergence is when I got there um, is how I got recruited. Um, so, um, but, so, basically, Fight Talk Prison, I know it started as D.C. to, like, specifically to stand against prisons and uh, from an environmentalist perspective. Um, it started with, specifically, Char Jordi and Patioti, and then it build, uh, built up... Um, and started becoming like a yearly convergence uh they always fall with the action okay one of the first victories was shutting down a prison in lexington uh kentucky it was a mega prison that was worth uh they were trying to propose about 500 million dollars towards um numbers a little off i mean there's the exact numbers not what i'm saying but it's, it's like that overall is half a billion dollar prison um so um that was, was first major victory and then one of the things that some of the things they utilized the fact that they were going to destroy the Lil lily cornet woods to be able to build the prison um they were uh gonna build it on like a coal slurry which when then would uh put more pollution into the runoff water that was all beside already there 
Um, and then they weren't thinking about the environmental impacts of those inside. So those were some of the first things they fundamentally used to be able to shut down that prison. The first prison out of the five we've stopped from them being able to build. Um, so um, that was like the first thing that happened. Um, I came in um, at the second convergence, and forgive me for not remember the year, um, ever since COVID, kind of years has been hard to kind of kind of blurry. I can't yeah. remember <laughs> But um <laughs> the second conversions in Denton is when I got invited. I got invited down because I was organizing up in Seattle um and I was uh doing the block the juvie um which was like block parties fighting the juvenile up there. Um and I had a long history of working in uh police and prison abolition because that's I know that's why I started organizing my whole community with snatched up by the prison industry. So it was like why I'm invested in organizing in the first place. It's like my entry point. So when I went down, I went down, I got flown down to Denton to go to the Convergence and speak uh, along with uh, Comrade Mark Cook and uh, some other comrades. Um, and when we got down there, it was really dope. It was, it was dope to see people who really meant it, right? Because when we talk about prison abolition, most people just like, yeah, 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 yeah. But as far as really mo- meaning it and trying to put action behind it, what's happening? So I was convinced from there. They like when I saw that was how real that was. I was like, all right. So that's when I, that's when I ended up getting brought in. They were like, yeah, you should, you should come join us. You should become F, part of FTP. I was like, you know what? I'm hella down. I am super down. If you, you should really shut down prisons. You're really doing real work. I'm down. Um, since then, you know, we've done multiple convergences, um, and basically, convergence is um, basically a national convergence of people who fight against uh, prisons one way or another, right? Um, including folks like MOVE, including um, uh, uh, there are multiple people like Savage Fam, including a lot of indigenous organizers, uh, according a lot of people from um, uh, different uh, aspects of this work. You know what I mean? Bring us all together to sit down and talk. And I'm really yeah. blanking, people, blanking groups and stuff. There's a bunch of people that came through. Um, our last big one before COVID hit, literally had like a thousand people. It was amazing. Um, and it allows us to network and plan and plot stuff out. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that it sounds like a lot of the stuff that you're doing to tackle it is just like very head on. It feels like, you know, you bring a lot of people together. You're figuring out ways to prevent many of these institutions from even being built in the first place. And do you all do work to support the prisoners that are like, already like in those like spaces or is it more like just like preventing these spaces from even being built in the first place like if you could walk me a bit more through like you know how do you support the people that are suffering from those conditions on the inside too if anything um well it's all of the above um we're actually in direct accountability to people inside so like um, first and foremost, more than even like S cons like me, but people who are directly inside still are who we're in, com- uh, uh, accountable to, um, we're in direct communication and we, um, from everything from letter writing to, uh, amplifying and supporting their actions. Right. So, uh, sometimes we will make phone zaps to support actions from the inside, from people organizing on the inside. Uh, it, it's really kind of fragile. I don't want to say too much about that because you don't want to expose people because yeah, the ramifications from the prison institution, we supported multiple hunger strikes, um, as well as like when we do the evacuation, because we did like, for example, hurricanes would hit, we would do phone zaps. One went viral and actually pushed them to evacuate a prison. Um, that was done with communication from people inside. So it wasn't, we just decided to do it, but we're literally communicating back and forth to, uh, know what was happening inside that prison, how it was going down and how we should respond and what they need to do. We also done other phone zaps to amplify, uh, amplify specific messages from people inside, specifically like actions against specific, uh, businesses that are profiting off of their labor and their back, like the telephone companies that utilize, exorbitant race to then leech off of those already marginalized folks and their families. Um, uh, those are some examples. There's, there's a lot of different ways we uh, do that, but it, it just depends on what's needed and where, what's called for, you know what I mean? Yeah, I got you, I got you. And then like when it comes to like, you know, climate change and the climate crisis, obviously um, I feel like people that are, you know, 
trapped in the prison industrial complex are probably like the last ones that are thought of um, because they are viewed as, you know, by mainstream society as like deserving of those kinds of conditions, uh, which is, you know, completely inhumane. Um, But I wanted to know more about like your take on, you know, you talked about fires and floods, but can you talk a little bit more on like why are folks that are in prisons, um, frontline communities uh, when it comes to the climate crisis? I mean, uh, capitalism. Uh, I mean, I don't really know how what to say. But it really just comes down to that, right? Because when you talk yeah. about capitalism, we're talking about racism, white like supremacy, and like targeting of communities. We're talking about also classism and targeting of impoverished, impoverished communities, and especially the intersections of that. Yeah. You know what I mean? And um, so not only are the prisons like sacrificial zones, but a lot of times our communities are sacrificial zones in one way or another. And so uh, we're coming from already environments that have been a lot of times stripped of resources. And if not stripped of resources, have been polluted by the companies and corporations that uh, we live around with uh, blatant disregard to our lives and our communities. I want to be very clear about something before I say this. Um, Crime is something that's constructed to aim and target people, and it has nothing, has very little correlation. I won't say no correlation, but very little correlation to harm. And harm and crime are not the same thing. Harm is what happens to people and how we we as, harm each other as people. Um, and then there is crime, which is something the law uh, said is wrong, right? So when we talk about the harm side of crime, to be very specific, right, we also got to think about things like, okay, well, poverty and how we're impoverished and how we're living in toxified communities which leads to things like where you can think about Flint, for example, and lead and the things that has on people's um, psychological makeup that even if you do see the times where there is more of the aggressive, violent outbursts in certain communities, you also see that go along areas that are polluted for multiple reasons because, one, you're not leaving people with much hope, so they're like, man, I might as well fight for the scraps. But for two, like you see lead has like effects on our mental health. We know this. We know it's a fact, but they don't care. So I think these have very big intersections. But again, it just falls back to capital. And it falls back to the people, the white supremacists at the top, and the people who, who kind of like dance a jig to for them um, don't really care about the communities that are then being incarcerated. And so it starts there and then spreads into the prison because we're already people who are targeted with the environmental racism, environmental white supremacy, environmental classism that exists within inside the society. Yeah, we have to address intersectional oppression. We have to address the ways in which um, communities have X, Y, and Z, like, factor placed against them already from the jump when they're even, like, born. They don't necessarily have the choice, and, like, they're put into certain communities where um, they don't have the same kind of opportunities and access to education and finances and resources that maybe would be preventative um, to prevent them from, you know, going down this route and I think like when we're talking about climate change um, I think like what is driving the climate crisis are still these same systems that have led to these communities becoming discarded by the system in the first place and so I think yeah like you were saying they are one and the same and I think um it's interesting when we are talking about frontline communities, though, I feel like in even like more privileged, like nonprofit circles, I don't really see many people necessarily bring up people who are in the prison industrial complex. Like that's not that's not like brought in the category. It's like black, brown, indigenous folks. But it's like, but is that people that you know, are educated people who have access to X, Y, and Z thing, people who are quote unquote on the right side of the law. Um, we don't necessarily talk about that. So I think it's, I think it's really important what you brought up is like, how do we start unpacking these views of what is justice and what is injustice and who is perpetuating that? Cause it gets very complex. I just want to say I have a personal bone to pick. So I wanted to, I wanted to, I wanted to like see if I could do that. Now, the same like a FTP wide and a criticism. I think a lot of people would agree with me. I don't think I have a problem with what I say, but I do want to say this. I think it's really important to recognize that the people, the academics, a lot of times who then utilize these struggles and stuff, and they utilize the things that happen to us as people who are what I call lumpen proletariat, or a lot of people call lumpen proletariat, right? But they don't 
they don't give us access. They said tokenize our experiences without us there. And so that's that's a yeah. big part of like especially yeah. environmentalism, but like just activism yeah. as a whole. You know what I mean? So but yeah. Yeah, no, that's what, that's what I'm saying. Like I think like even like I mean a big part of the show is criticizing mainstream environmentalism. Um and I think mainstream environmentalism talks about frontline communities, but I don't really see this this community being recognized that much. And that was also a really important reason why I wanted to bring this on my show because I just think it's not talked about enough or at least it's not talked about in like the circles of people that are fighting for climate justice. Um, I think it, it might be assumed, but I don't think it's addressed enough. People talk about restorative justice a lot in organizing spaces, but I think that maybe my audience or people who listen to this might not know what that is. So I was just wondering, like, the vision that fight toxic prisons when you are shutting down um, a prison from being built or you are trying to address this issue um, when it comes to abolition and restorative justice, um, could you explain more about, like, what y'all's vision is as the alternative to prisons? So there isn't one answer. It all is contextual, all is based on the community, the needs of the community, needs of the people, what happened, um, how it happened. All those things come into play, and you can't just – accountability isn't going to look the same uh, for each situation because we're not like the law. We don't like third-degree assault. Like, okay, when we see assault, yeah. like, okay, what happened? Why did it happen? You know what I mean? Was the person justified? We asked those questions. Like, was that a justified response? If it was a justified response, then should they really f face negative repercussions for something that was really justified behind? Let's see the context. So the difference between harm and crime, um, crime is this arbitrary thing that is created by the state to then, you know, bring in more slaves, to build the prison industrial complex. Um, most crimes are not something that directly harms people. A lot of it is property-based financial crimes, um, crimes that uh, people would argue land in a gray area, like selling drugs or something like that, or things that should clearly only apply to oneself, like using drugs, you know what I mean? And these things, a lot of times, are either not harm, or you could debate if they are, because my stance selling drugs is like, Drugs are harm can be harmful, but the person selling drugs and the people using drugs aren't harming people. It's it's just the literally environment that we're in that causes harm. And I also believe that a lot of things that we equate to the to drugs is actually just um, really the trauma that people are facing. And drugs is one way of treating that trauma, but that's a whole other story. But but harm then would be things like you know, violence would be things like sexual assault, would be things, I don't want to get too much, I don't want to trigger people, but like, would be some of those things that we're like, okay, this is actual things that we got to deal with because it actually hurts people, right? And we see a lot of times with this state not caring about harm when it comes to crime. A lot of times people who harm people, if they have resources, for example, will walk away with without consequences and don't get it wrong. I'm not saying consequences should be prison for anybody, but that that's, yeah. the state doesn't really care about that. But it does care about the, people who then they can put behind bars and what group, what uh, community they come from. Um, so when we get to the solutions of those things, we got to look in the context of what's going on. Well, we know that most most crimes are economically based, even, even the ones that cause harm. And so a lot of solutions could become from, instead of putting money into the prisons, take that money, put it in the prisons and put it into the communities to support communities. Whether it's talking about mental health, housing, um, being able to uh, get uh, therapy or whatever else, therapy don't work for everybody, um, to be very clear, to help with deal with trauma, to build support networks. Those type of things will alleviate the majority of what people call crime and even the majority of what people call harm. Um, and then for the things that isn't yeah. alleviated, I think it would be a community com community by community response, right? What is what is the context of your community? Why does this happen? And let's have to bring the community together to figure it out because people, strangers who have no investment in our communities will not make the right decisions because they do not care. And I think there's this kind of notion among capitalism, among the justice, the so-called justice system, that not caring is somehow a good thing, that it is somehow the way to be unbiased. And that's just BS, right? You want people who care about that person who did wrong as well as the person they harmed to both be within a cipher trying to figure out how do we deal with something. Um, and I think a lot, also a lot of harm is just, like I said, alleviated by addressing the economic social realities that create the so-called crime. I mean, not so-called harm, harm, <laughs> but so-called crime.
Yeah. I think it's really great that the work that you all do is very rooted in community-led solutions. Uh, that's something that I really push here on my show is that like when it comes to addressing all of these issues related to the climate crisis, when it is counter to the system, that is capitalism that we live in today. It requires community support. It requires networks of support that is not um, top down. It has to be has to be bottom up. It has to be led by the context of the community. And so I really love that you offer that as part of addressing this very very intense issue of um, trying to meet people where they're at and not just discarding them. I think that that speaks to like, I don't know, that's kind of the antithesis of the society we live in in some ways, where at least here in Western U United States, um, it, it's, it's like we live in a society that's focused on um, fast paced, disposability culture, cancel culture, um, trying to you know, paint villains, <laughs> paint villains versus um, heroes, things like that. Um, and people really like those very binary stories. And I think when you're trying to address things like mutual aid and um, community empowerment, um, it gets more tricky because now these people are in your network. You're not viewing them as disposable. You want to build a relationship with them. You want to figure out what intentional accountability means. Um, and that requires a lot of patience and a lot of, a lot of just emotion, <laughs> emotion and heart and care. It's a, it's a lot. And I think it, it does require people to unlearn a lot of conditioning in some ways um, to like be able to even embody that. So I think that's really, really amazing that that's, that's what you all are doing. What keeps you grounded in this work? It feels like it's very emotionally intensive and you know, you're giving a lot of care and um, energy to it at all times. And so I just wanted to know like from your standpoint, like, yeah, what keeps you going and what are the tools that you rely on to allow you to stay um, motivated in this work? Um, I don't know, this might be a little depressing, but for me is, as somebody who was like an ex-con and my whole community was snatched up by the prison industrial complex. Like there's like, when I went to the prison, it was like a high school reunion for me. You know what I mean? Like everybody was there. And most people from my city, especially as being a highly gentrified city and if people didn't realize, but Washington, um, which is where I'm from, Washington state, um, it has right behind Portland has the second highest, um, incarceration rate for black folks. So you're, you know, I mean, out of all the states, they're, you're most likely to get contracted there if you're black, right? And so my whole community disappeared into it. So I'm really kind of invested because it, it literally is my life's struggle. It is what it is. You know what I mean? I don't really have any other option but to be invested. This isn't like just some theory for me. It isn't anything like that. This is very real. And when I think about people um, trying to liberate people and get people free, I'm thinking about actual people. I'm not just thinking about, in theory, these people I don't know. Like, yeah, I'm thinking about people I don't know too, but like, I'm thinking about actual physical, people, <laughs> you know what I mean? And so uh, for yeah. me, that keeps me grounded in it because I didn't really think there's another choice. Also, this be a bug. I've, I've been doing this since I got out of the joint when I was like, uh, well, I got out of 22 and I've been organizing since 20, uh, 23. So uh, now I'm, 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 I'm saying I'm a decade in. I don't want to give my age completely away, but I'm a decade in. So uh, um, I shouldn't say that as a rapper because then I'm too old to rap apparently. Um, but, no, <laughs> definitely not. <laughs> but, uh, like, um, I, I'm, I'm so far into this thing that I don't really think I have, like, there's nowhere else to go. All are in the back. Yeah, I'm a content creator, but it's still coming from my context. It's still, everything is still coming from where I'm coming from. So what I'm mm -hmm. investing in that, yeah, I'm going to tell I either, like, succeed or uh, meet the, the ma meet my maker. So, you know, it just is what it yeah. is. But. I mean, I get it. I get it. Like, I feel very similarly about my work it's like you don't sometimes choose these things they choose you so i feel it <laughs> i get it i get it just as like a last point like you know you had talked about at the beginning about um just like some of like the pollution or like the toxic harms and we did have a previous guest who talked specifically about the conditions in detention centers and how they were like spraying chemicals and um things like that and exposing folks um i was just wondering like 
you know, from what you observed uh, when you were dealing with uh, being incarcerated, uh, like, what did you notice that? Like, were people spraying things? Like, were like, I know you were talking about the food, like, were there other aspects? Because I just wanted to like, paint a picture for the audience a little bit more about it. Because you mentioned some things, but I just like, I really want to like, ground it into people about like, how terrible this is. I mean, I didn't see people spraying things. But also, we're in the <laughs> desert. The, it, on top of like military weapons disposal area and so we also had so even though they don't actively like here we're gonna spray it on you at least no that i know of um they were definitely you know allowing us to inhale all the dust and and, and dirt that comes up from all this toxic stuff we get hit with sandstorms the water um i didn't know this till after i actually found this out from fdp i didn't know this when i was there at my, the prison i was at the prison i was at had like elevated like um copper in the water it's like like sky hot high the whole time we're drinking it and i don't know if it has what the effects of that are but like this i found out actually at one of the first uh workshops i went to as one of the new members of five thousand prison that somebody who apparently was at the same prison i was at at the same time i was came out and had their copper levels measured from the water and it would just through the roof and so like that was like one of the ways we were going through it. And I obviously went through it too, but I didn't know it because, you know, I never got my blood ran like that. You know, um, it, it, it depends on the prison because some prisons I'm sure do spray stuff and do intentionally pollute people. I know that, um, that they also do a lot of other atrocious things that are not necessarily environmental, but, uh, you know, are pretty bad in multiple different prisons. It depends on the prison you're at. So, um, uh, I, I, I can't really speak on like from experience at least, um things i've seen besides the ones i've been to but i know there's a lot more and um i also know like i said they they yeah. utilize us as the people at the forefront of the environment the crisis whether it's fighting it or suffering from it in multiple different ways so i just also wanted to ask you know how can people take action and then get involved with supporting the work at um ftp or fight fight fighting toxic prisons oh my gosh i can't say words today um, how can people support your work? Um, well, you your can... work and the organization's work. Okay. Oh, both. Okay. 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 Well, let me start with Fight Toxic Prisons first. So, Fight Toxic Prisons, for example, you can find us on Facebook, Campaign to Fight Toxic Prisons, or uh, I think it's Fight X Prisons on Twitter, and then Fight Toxic Prisons on Instagram. Might be the other way around. I'm, I'm, I, I can't remember, but uh, um, and. Uh, uh, some of the ways to support, well, one thing is do work where you're at, you know what I mean? And then connect with us. That's, that's first off, first and foremost, because the most you can do to help is by helping your own community, right? That's the most off top every time, right? Um, but like also you can connect with us, network. One of the things that we're really working on right now that we can put on, and luckily we've been able to get a hold put on her execution, but uh, uh, Melissa uh, Luciano, but uh, they were actually said to be executed. And you can go on all our social medias. You can find all the links to it. You can also go on my stuff, Overthrow Media. Um, we just shared that we are able to stop the execution. Basically, she was a single mom who um, was, fall well, we would argue is falsely arrested based off of, of one of her child children's death. There are multiple witnesses, including her children, saying she did not uh, kill her child. But state takes didn't really care. And so they were about to try to execute her. And then... Uh, including them hiding forensic evidence that came up later that would clear, that would show that there's reason to doubt that she actually killed her child, that she got the death penalty put on hold and they're going to review her case. So any support people can support, write letters or call in. That's a, that's a big one. Um, also there's a documentary um, on Netflix that talks about it as well as a uh, comrade, professor flowers also had a whole video talking about um, what's going on with her case. So that's the way to support right now as well as when we have phones, apps support it. Um, but I think fundamentally it's really building um, abolitionist movements where you're at and then networking with us. Cause that's really what it makes a difference. Cause we also don't know everything. Every time we like, like for example, the prisons that we shut down in Alabama, people who we have met and network with reached out to us and brought us into that fold. You know what I mean? We didn't know about that at first. And then we were able to bring our skills and the knowledge we have from actually having victories to help those victories go forward. You know what I mean? Um, so yeah, I think that's the biggest thing is just to build where you're at, connect with us, network with us, but not just us with any IWOC, any, any, any organization 
building against abolition. I think building these networks is really how we do it because we're not like trying to lead the army to the gates of uh, the prison to tear it down. You know, we want the the people to go ahead and decide collectively, just to, you know, pick those little bricks off the wall and let people out. You know what I'm saying? But uh, yeah. yeah, does yeah. that make sense? I know it's not the answer people want to hear. People want to be like, we got this plan. You got to hop on. And we have plans, but you know, it's all of us putting in this work, not just us at FTP. It's like a collective thing that we all got to do because we're just, you know, we're just a handful of people like the meaning. You know? Yeah. Yeah, totally, totally. Well, thank you so much for all of that information. Uh, we really appreciate it. Follow Fight Toxic Prisons on Instagram. And then what what is your personal Instagram if you want people to check out your work? Villainous underscore music on Instagram, Twitter, uh, TikTok, SoundCloud, Bandcamp, because I'm a musician too, Patreon, all that stuff. And Overthrow Media is my YouTube, um, which is it has a little it's a little bit of a buzz, but not 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 big, but you know. So if y'all could check it out, you know, I do a lot to like um a, talk, a lot of time about politics, a lot of time about music, as well as a lot of t- like trying to elevate voices as I'm doing this tour um, that I run into and the organizations that are doing like especially mutual hate organizations. Um, so, and I hate to bring in any academia, and honestly, I even hate this myself. From like, I feel like a lot of like academic spaces always ask this, but like, are there any books or resources that you recommend? Like, if there's three top ones that you think people should check out after this. So this isn't prison-based, but here's a good one based off the context of this conversation. Our Enemies in Blue. Um, that's a good one. We talk about policing. And policing and prisons can't be too divorced. Um, as for... Uh, I would say read anything from Mumia, but specifically my favorite book was a basic uh, collection of writings called uh, Everything Censored by Mumia Abu-Jamal. Um, and then, of course... Wretched of the Earth for show, just as a decolonial, like the concept of where a lot of people who are liberation fighters that come from the side background are coming from. Um, and I got one. I got one. I would recommend that I feel like has context to the black experience, but also prison to some degree. Or well, two actually. I got so Blood in My Eyes by George Jackson, <laughs> and then the controversial one that I got to give a disclaimer for is the person who wrote it. It's a shit person. No, no less. He was a very integral role in the revolutionary movements and does have some really good things as well as some really fucked up things he says in this book. But I think it's still worth reading despite his fucked upness. So Soul on Ice by Eldridge Cleaver. And that's, um, I always put that disclaimer because he was a shit person that would never vouch for in any way ever. But like he did do a lot of revolutionary shit and did have a lot of <laughs> solid takes that were, were crucial but he also has some shit takes. And if you read that book, you'll see what I'm talking about. I don't want to put everybody through it right here on this, you know. So that one is not family friendly. I'm going to emphasize that. Soul on Ice is super not family That's friendly. That's okay. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much for offering all those resources. Uh, everyone, make sure that you check out on Instagram and on YouTube. Um, I have links for their fundraiser and petitions and things you can do to get involved right now um, to support their work moving forward. Um, Make sure that you check them out, follow them, subscribe to their channels, and also make sure that you subscribe to Brown Girl Green. And um, you can subscribe to Brown Girl Green on all podcast listening platforms, on YouTube, follow us on Instagram, um, and sign up for the Brown Girl newsletter, which is bit.ly slash browngirlnews. Thank you so much for joining us today for this awesome episode and educating us about the conditions happening in prisons and why people who are invested in the fight for environmental justice should also take this fight into account as well. Thank you so much.